I'm really happy today to be speaking to Ramsey Fawaz, professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, about his book, The New Mutants, Superheroes, and the Radical Imagination of American Comics. Ramsey, I thought we could maybe start with an intriguing thing that you mentioned from the very beginning of your book, which is that when you first came across the X-Men, you were really excited because even back then, quote, I was spectacularly gay and exceptionally bookish. <laughs> yes, it's, both things are true. And I'm wondering, for people who might not make that connection, how, how does that relate to being into comics like X-Men and, and the others that you mentioned? It's a great question. I mean, I can say that there are two ways in which I can answer that. So the first is that I grew up in a gay family in suburban Orange County, California. So my mom was a lesbian. She, at the time, was with her ex-partner. My brother and I were both coming out of the closet in our teenage years. And there was a way in which I was deeply invested in the idea of alternative kinship formation. You know, I was growing up in a very white, very conservative, but also very wealthy and comfortable part of the country. And so I had a beautiful education, but I also felt like our family could not be open and real about who we were. So I was when I first encountered the X-Men, I was really, really deeply taken by the idea of the team of mutants as a kind of a, a collection of people who had found one another and produced an alternative family formation that to me, by comparison to mine, was also very queer, right? Mm -hmm. And the second way in which I would say is that as somebody who was very loud, very flamboyant, still am, um, I love to dance. I took, I took uh, dance classes for years. There were all of these aspects of my masculinity that were kind of not in line with traditional masculinity. It was very obvious to me when I saw the X-Men, like these were a multiracial menagerie of people who were all dressed in these extremely flamboyant, beautiful, disco-like outfits. And that was really compelling. I felt there was a way in which being a mutant also meant that you dressed up, right? That you also represented it in the way that you, that you dressed and the way you presented yourself to the world. It's kind of ironic. A friend of mine posted in this beautiful, famous panel of the character Storm from the 1980s, where she's dressed in this amazing kind of like pink bomber jacket and tight, what's it called? Like pencil dress. And Wolverine is like, wow, like that's quite a look. And she's like, as long as I'm true to myself, I can like always present however I want to on the surface. And if people want to, they should get to know me better. But like, I'm allowed to kind of like, she's thinking about how fashion might allow her to present herself in all of these different ways. So those are kind of two of the ways in which like, I had this deeply queer connection to comics. Yeah, I mean, and it made sense as soon as I read that. But I was thinking, to anyone who doesn't understand or who hasn't maybe read or seen the X-Men, that probably needs some explanation there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When, I guess, did you realize that you might be able to look into something like the X-Men or comics in an academic and rigorous way? When did that really strike you and when did you begin? Really, I have to attribute that so much to one of my greatest mentors to whom she's one of the people that I dedicate the book to. Kathleen Moran was the chair of American Studies at UC Berkeley when I was an undergraduate there. And she really took me under her wing after I'd taken one or two classes with her. She really felt that I was uh, destined to study American Studies, which is what I got my PhD in ultimately. And she asked me to be her teaching assistant as an undergraduate. Can you imagine? Like to be a teaching assistant as an undergrad at Berkeley was such an amazing vote of confidence. And she taught a class on consumer society. And that was the class I was a TA for. And she said to me at the beginning, she said, I'd love for you to give a lecture later in the class. Like, and, and maybe you can think about comics since you've been a fan. And I was like, I've never really thought about studying comics in this way. I knew I wanted to study popular culture, but nobody had kind of given me permission to do that. So I, I, I dutifully did all this research and I developed a, a lecture about comic book collecting as a consumer act. And she, mm -hmm. she read it far in advance of my lecture. And she was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, this is so boring. You're just telling like, <laughs> the history of collecting. And she said, you are a brilliant, close reader. Like, that's what you do so well. So, like, do something really innovative where you think about consumption in the superhero com comic book. And I thought about it and I thought, what is the story that I'm enamored of that is all about consumption? And it popped into my head. I was like, it's the Dark Phoenix saga. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a story about a benevolent, powerful woman, cosmic woman character who's also a cosmic being, Jean Grey, the Phoenix, who becomes kind of a monstrous world consuming 
deity, right? And so the story is so much about consumption, both the literal consumption of energy. She eats an entire star and kills another, like a star system far from our own. But it's also about a group of greedy billionaire industrialists, right? Of the Hellfire Club who want to harness her energies to take over the world. So I reread that story and I developed this really close analysis of the story in relationship to the energy crisis of the late 1970s. And I gave this talk and she came up to me and she's like, this is what you need to do research on. She's like, this is, you nailed it. She said, you know, this is such a beautiful analysis of this text. And that was really the first time I started to think about it. And because of that, I applied for this amazing fellowship that I still think exists at Yale University called the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. I submitted this thing saying, I want to write a thesis about superhero teams and queer families in the late 20th century. I got it. And it was the first time that a university paid me, you know, $2,500 plus housing to go live to go live there and read, write, and research for a whole summer. And I just was hooked. I was like, this is what I want to do for my life. Not study comics, but to study culture, right? And comics happened to be one thing that I wanted to study. So that was kind of where it all started. Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like a great experience. And it, it makes me think about the way that some people might get some friction when they introduce comics. I mean, how do you deal with or what advice would you give to somebody, maybe a, a younger student or even a uh, a scholar, a more mature scholar who wants to be able to do a study like that, but is getting pushed back, I guess, with the, you know, a lot of the preconceived notions that we've heard that comics aren't worthy of study or that uh, this is just simply um, you're dressing up adolescent ideas with with uh, theories or with impressive words uh -huh. when it's really not worthy of study like that. What What is your response? Because I'm sure you've come across that in yeah, your time. Yeah. Oh, many times. And, you know, there's so many different approaches. But the first thing that I will say to anybody who is having to come up against this is never to be defensive. There is no point when, when you have to start to vociferously defend something, you suddenly become somebody who is obviously unsure about the value of what it is that you're working with. The fact is something that I always say is that whether or not you think comics matter, they have sold in the millions. They are one of the most important forms of American popular culture more Americans read comics and have read comics than almost any other form of literary production besides newsprint. So there is the basic argument that's the media studies argument of circulation. Like these are widely circulated, widely read. They had extraordinary numbers of audiences. They've also been productive of a lot of response. Unlike many other media like novels and film, there's a massively well-documented response by fans to comics in fanzines, letter pages. So it's one form of media that allows us to get access to the question of reader response, which traditional literary studies is obsessed with. I have a brilliant former student who's now at the University of Georgia on a brilliant postdoc. She is writing a book that's all about, her name is Leah Meismer, and she is writing a book about the way that comics in the late 20th century produce a counter public, meaning audiences that respond back to the production of comics and allow us to gain insight into kind of the dialogue between creators and fans in a way that we don't see in a lot of other mediums. You know, second, fans themselves, especially starting in the late 50s, describe comics as literature consistently. And so whether or not we think that comics are literature with a capital L, it is how they were viewed by their readership. And we're talking about a readership that spanned seven-year-old boys to octogenarians, you know, to African-American teenagers, to college-age radicals. The incredible breadth of audiences that read comics is astonishing and deserves study. And the final thing that I would say is it's really, I mean, the critique of comics as trash objects that shouldn't be studied is so boring at this point. It's just all about, you know, it's all about bias towards different objects. So often when, when traditional literary scholars say, you know, this isn't worthy, I say, you know, would you say that Blake's woodcuts, William Blake's woodcuts, which are these images he produced next to his poems, are not worthy of study next to his poems? We would never say that. When we study all of his poetry, we put it next to the visual culture of his, of his poetics. 
that many people probably in his times viewed it as childish, as undermining the power of the poetics, right? So the fact that we would take something seriously like William Blake, but not comics, is merely about bias towards certain objects, that we've decided arbitrarily that some objects are of value and some are not. And I just don't really have time for that argument. At some level, I just don't need to argue with people who believe that. Because for me, it's like I look at my colleagues who I think are brilliant, and I say, if you want to study an esoteric surrealist poet who five people read in 1922, hey, listen, if you can convince me why that poetry matters, then I'm totally in for the game, right? I just want everybody to make an argument for why they study, what they study matters. So, you know, one could argue that that very few, as, as Janet Flatter would say, you know, how many people read James Joyce's Ulysses cover to cover? She says, I wonder and I disbelieve. You know, and so there's a sense of like, if we're still willing to study a book that is not as widely circulated as it used to be that few people read, then why shouldn't we study something that so many people read? Yeah. Well, and I think that it is interesting to see the change in the last even decade or especially in the last few decades, because less and less, I think we get pushback or or we get flat out rejection of comics as as worthy of study. And so it does seem to be picking up a lot of steam in academics. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is the moment. Yeah. So that said, how do you know or how do you start to look for a really good quality study of comics, whether that be a, a sort of industry-wide thing yeah. or a close reading? How do you start to differentiate then the difference between a, a really profound study of comics in whatever way you're looking at it, and something that's less that's less profound or that's less rigorous. How do you how do you start to look for that, especially for people who aren't familiar? This is a tricky question, right? Because in many ways, comic studies has been much maligned for a long, long time. People have looked at comic studies and for a long time and said, you know, this is not really smart work. You know, you're you're studying a medium that nobody cares about. So I want to tread lightly here because I really want to respect the extraordinary amount of output of scholarship that classical comic studies has produced. In many ways, mm -hmm. you know, comic studies can go back all the way to the 1920s and 30s when Gilbert Seldes, who was um, a, a famous cultural, his, cultural critic, wrote this book called The Seven Lively Arts, where he named seven different artistic modes that had become uniquely American. And one of those comics and comic strips. So like people have been writing about comics and comic strips forever. And I always start by, by recommending that good or bad, if you really want to understand a field, you have to read widely across the entire field to start to figure out what you value and what you think is great. So there's that, right? Like there's just the fact that like you should read the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, because you, that's what gives you a sense of what counts as good. However, I will say, and this is where I, I, my own bias shows up. I've had, if you read my book very carefully and you read the footnotes, you will see that I do not cite classical comic studies very frequently. And it's partly because when I was writing my book, originally as a dissertation and then in revisions, I felt extremely dissatisfied with the fact that the majority of studies of comics ignored questions of sexuality and gender or else only read or interpret comics as being racist, as being ideological, as being limited. So there was a kind of limited understanding of comics as a space where identity and radical politics were being played out. There was also a tendency in comic studies to focus almost exclusively on form. So you have a lot of brilliant comic book studies that really focus just on the way that comics are mapped out on a page, right? The work of people like Thierry Grandstein, the French kind of analyst of the system of comics, Scott McCloud's work. A lot of this work beautifully shows you how comics operate on the page, but they can't explain to you how comics are deployed or used to express particular stories uh, about gender, about power, about democracy, about these bigger questions. So here's what I would say. What for me distinguishes a stronger work of comics, cultural studies, or criticism from a, a less, like a, a weaker one, is a book that can show you how the distinct operation, both the form and the content of particular comics, speak to much wider structures of power, identity, politics, 
and social reality in any given context. If a book can scale back and forth or an article from the very specificities of the comic book page to then tell you something about the world in which people who are reading that comic is operating, that to me is a strong study. Because listen, many people do not read comics today. So if you're gonna do good comic studies, you have to convince those readers that comics matter because they're gonna look at you and say like, look, I never read comics. I didn't collect them, why should I care? And so I think those kinds of works are really, really compelling because they can scale outward. So if you think about, for instance, Charles Hatfield's book, Hand of Fire, which is this incredibly specific study of one of the most important artists in the history of superhero comic books, Jack Kirby. Even though it's practically an artistic biography of this person, it is also about the Cold War. It is also about American visual culture. It is also about our fetishization of technology. Um, Hillary Chute's new book, um, Disaster Drawn, is not only about documentary comics, it's about how documentary comics speak to questions of war, violence, genocide. Um, Deborah Whaley's extraordinary book, Black Women in Sequence, is an American take on comics that does not merely track representations of black women in sequential art. It thinks about how blackness as a visual and representational problem gets taken up in different comics modes from anime to video games to classical comic books. So books like these and many more that are coming out are doing really interdisciplinary work that is thinking about comics in a much wider network of social, cultural, and and political relationships. To me, that's interesting work. Well, and that makes a lot of sense. It actually leads me to the next thing I wanted to ask you. And my only uh, complaint about your book, and I yeah, say that yeah. with air quotes that you can't really see, is that every time I'm, well, every time I'm reading it, or when I started off reading it, I was thinking, I really got to read more Fantastic Four. And so I would want to go and pick up and I was getting some stuff. Yeah. And you, I mean, you, you do a great job of getting all of these examples, uh, some of which I knew about and others, I was thinking, I really should know that as a comics yeah. fan. And so I would want to read it. How do you know you're ready to write? Maybe there, maybe there's not a clear idea, but how do you know that you're ready to write about, say, the Fantastic Four or oh. Superman when there's literally millions of issues? And I know it's so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. How do you how do you know when you're ready versus you need to read more actual comics? This question is applicable to any form of cultural analysis, right? Like, how do you get a sense mm -hmm. of what the limit of your archive is going to be? Mm -hmm. So like you said, there are so many hundreds of thousands of pages written about these different characters and, and they span decades of production. First of all, and this is just the painful part of the reality of studying this kind of stuff. You just have to read really, really, really widely and a lot, first of all. So part of what I do is if I'm looking at a particular historical moment, so let's say I want to, I knew that I wanted to start the book with the 60s, right? Which is the era that we associate with the Marvel Renaissance. It's also the moment, right, of the, of the rise of radical, like the, the resurgence of radicalism in the United States. It's like the, the flashpoint for where I wanted the book to start. So I look around mm -hmm. and I say, what were the most popular comic books of this period? I can look up statistics. I can look up the way people talked about comics. And it becomes very obvious that things like the Justice League of America, the Fantastic Four, uh, the X-Men for a brief period of time are popular. So first, what I start doing is I, I use my intuition to decide what books I might end up writing about. So it seemed clear that I was probably going to write about the Justice League because they seem to speak to a lot of notions of post-war internationalism. And I might write about the Fantastic Four, but I wasn't 100 percent sure because I needed to read widely. So then what I would do is I would name those for myself and then I would name like six other series that seemed equally as important. Legion of Superheroes, later in the 60s, The Avengers, right? Like all of the different things. And what I would do is I would spend a couple of weeks just reading broadly like 10 issues from each comic book. And I could already tell within 10 to 15 issues which of them seemed to have the richest content which seemed to be reflecting the others. And then what I would do is once I decided which ones I needed to focus on, I would read, basically I would probably read between like 40 to 60 issues of that comic book. And that's a lot. That's like 3,000 plus pages mm -hmm. of comics. Here's what starts to happen. When you read that much, you begin to see patterns 
in a particular run. So you start to say like, oh, I can tell that there is this pattern and now it's changing. I can tell that for the first 20 issues of the Fantastic Four is really sexist. But after issue 20, there's this huge response by fans that Sue Storm should be more powerful. And they respond to that. But then later she gets married and again, she's hyper feminized. So you can see these different shifts. And you can also tell when an era is over. I could just tell at some point that by issue 70 of the Fantastic Four, something about the Kirby Stanley run, which was still ongoing, changed because you're reaching the end of the 60s and they're responding to new realities. So it's at that point that I say, okay, I got the picture, right? I get that I'm going to focus on this era because I don't want to talk about the 70s. I'm going to look at different comics. So what I also did while reading the, the base comics I wanted to study is I continued to read some parts of the Avengers, the Legion of Superheroes, because I want to know what else is happening in the field of production. So like, I don't want to be just focusing on one comic. And then somebody says like, oh, but why didn't you talk about the Legion of Superheroes? Mm -hmm. You decide where you need to limit based on patterns that you see. But of course, you need to read widely enough to start seeing the pattern. You can't say there's one until you've read a certain number. And that always depends on the, the given text. Now, I'll tell you, I wrote seven chapters and I read at least four to 7,000 pages of comics for each chapter. And that does not even include political documents, prime, other primary sources, fan and letter pages, and all of the secondary sources, the scholarship, the cultural history, the theory, right? So I had to do it very, very much methodically. And I would give myself about a month for each chapter of just reading comics every day. I would read, you know, 15 issues. And I reread a lot of that material because I wanted to know it kind of at a cellular level. Part of it is like, is using your intuition and your hunch. But at the beginning, you just have to read widely until you can see the terrain clearly enough to start making judgments about what you will and will not pursue. That's really helpful to, to hear how you break that down, because I think comics can be one of the most intimidating forms of media at least oh yeah yeah i mean because there are just so many and it's so diverse the amount especially today that are available i mean if you're a graduate student and you want to be able to write about foucault yeah. or, or deleuze you read all of their books and that that's pretty doable right i mean it might take a few years but if you're reading all of their books then i feel fairly confident yeah. that i can say yeah. i understand this because i've read everything he or she has written in comics i don't know if that's possible to read everything that has been written about say batman or superman or whatever yeah and i don't think that you need to. I mean, I think that that's the point of a broad... There's a reason why the oeuvre of Shakespeare is still written about extensively by early modernists, because there's an infinite number of interpretations that we can produce in different contexts. There is yet to be somebody to study, you know, how people in Senegal read Shakespeare when Shakespeare circulates there, or Jane Austen, right? Like, there's mm -hmm. so many different ways to approach these comics. I recently heard of an amazing scholar, I believe at the University of Cairo, named Munira Soliman who I could be wrong, but I believe I was told that she's writing a book about the translation of Marvel Comics into Arabic. So like here is an amazing field that is untapped that somebody's starting to think about. She's going to decide which comics are most interesting to study. Like that's part of being a good scholar is using your intuition to start to decide, I'm going to talk about this, but not this. A number of people have said to me, could you not choose a completely different set of heroes to look at? Like, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, The Punisher, Daredevil, that actually tells a much more conservative story about masculinity and vigilantism. And I said, absolutely, you could. I'm not interested in that story because that story has been told many, many times before about comics, mm -hmm. that they're masculinists, that they're white, that they're conservative. But that's not the only story, right? Like, I want to tell a different story. So I'm going to look at a different archive to do that. I'm not cherry picking because I've read widely enough to get a sense of the field and to know what is really generative. For instance, I think it is very telling that in the last 60 or so years of comics production, 50, 50 or 60, starting at about 1962, what would you say from that period is the most identifiable comic book series that is like the most popular? Like when we think of comics after 1960, what is the comic book we think of? That's a good question. What do you think? <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, it's widely known beyond comic book circles. Starting there, so not Batman or Superman from the '40s or anything. Uh, I would no, I would say starting in 1960. Okay, so, well then, yeah, I mean, X Men seems to be up there al there along with Spider Man. Exactly. Yeah. I would say the X Men. I would say the X Men even more than Spider Man. I mean, Sp no, you're right. I mean, Spider Man is very, very widely known, but I would say the X Men 
is the single most popular, well-circulated, beloved comic book. And it's become such a touchstone for the post-war period that it is now almost synonymous with the problem of difference and multiculturalism mm-hmm. and diversity in comics. And so what I think is interesting is that while there is the strand of vigilantism, masculinity, whiteness, conservatism in comics, it is telling that the X-Men is the thing that people remember the most, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that story. It's not that masculinist story. You could say that Wolverine is part of that, but Wolverine is a very complex character whose masculinity is always kind of in flux in complex ways. You know, I think part of it is about your intuition and also letting your audience know that you are looking at a particular slice of a comic book. I don't claim to say a statement about the entirety of the Fantastic Four. I say I'm talking about the Fantastic Four as they were presented in this period. But we can use some of the ideas that I provide to talk about superheroes more broadly, right? But I'm not saying that 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 theoretical model is applicable everywhere at all times. I want other people to make their own arguments. Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah, so, I mean, particularly in cultural studies, American studies, there are issues of uh, whether or not you approach it from the point of view of a reader, like an interpretive audience point of view or a production company, or the author. And, you know, there are so many ways that you could look at it. I'm looking just at one reading that, uh, I mean, you say it, and then when I read it, it sounds so obvious, but I I didn't really think of it like that before. You say that uh, the Fantastic Four, for example, as they took shape in the 1960s, they became countercultural figures, a left-wing intellectual, uh, the liberal feminist, the youth activist, and the Mm maladjusted queer, which is funny because I never saw it before, and now I can't help but see it. Yeah, yeah uh, I know it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if uh, let's say you were to re- you were to say that you were to make that argument, and then someone like Jack Kirby or somebody Stan Lee come and s- for some reason they see this and they say, no, 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 that's not at all what we had in mind. Or somebody reads it and says, when I was reading this, I did not see that. In fact, I saw quite the opposite. Is there some way that you know that you are making uh, a strong argument, or is there some way that you approach it uh-huh. and ask? Uh, about validity, because I mean, this, these are yeah. things that you can always argue about, and you may always get disagreement. So how do you know you're making a strong yeah. argument? Well, first of all, let me say I'm never, never claiming that this is the final and definitive interpretation of the Fantastic Four. Mm-hmm. What I'm arguing is that this interpretation was available to people in that historical moment. So one way that I make that a strong argument is that I do accept extensive research into the ways that people in this period are understanding left-wing politics, the relationship of the left, gender and sexuality, how people are thinking about the American family. I'm reading everything from cultural histories and intellectual histories of this moment to the feminine mystique, you know, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, Mm -hmm. to think about radioactivity and bodies. I'm reading Students for a Democratic Society. I'm reading critiques of feminism and early feminism, I'm actually understanding how people thought about gender and sexuality in this period. So for instance, I make the kind of controversial claim that the Fantastic Four embodies certain notions about gender transitivity or transgender in the early 60s. Guess what? Do a little bit of, like a lot of people have been like, that's a really bold claim. And I'm like, it's not. (laughs) Because the early 60s is fundamentally known by everybody who studies the period as the moment when the idea of transgender entered the American consciousness. It's the moment when Christine Jorgensen, the first kind of publicly out sex change operation figure Mm. in America, who used to be a former GI in World War II, came out to the public. It's like, there are so many different ways. It's like when hormone replacement therapy becomes widely available. You know, all of these things, transgender historians like Susan Stryker and and the art historian David Getze will talk about this early 60s as the moment of trans liberation. So this, this was in the water. So my reading of the comic book is not merely a forcing of my logic onto the comic. So there's a comics historian named Mark Singer, who's one of a handful of people, small handful of people that have written like a really negative review of my book. He produced like a very negative reading of my book. And I often feel like misreads a lot of what I say. But one of the implications of his his interpretation of my book is that I'm forcing a kind of queer reading retroactively on these comic books. And let me tell you, this was in the water at the time. It mm-hmm. was not accidental. You know, like they understood the logic of sexuality. These guys were plugged in. So 
one way in which I produce a strong read is just to like actually know the history, right? Mm -hmm. Another is to, is to know the text and its internal logic so well that when I make these arguments, exactly what you said happens. You see it everywhere. The reason you see it everywhere once you read the comic is because it was already there. <laughs> so part of the way this happened for me is this. It was like reverse. Do you know the comic book Unstable Molecules by James Sturm? No, I feel like I should, but I don't. It's a brilliant. Oh, it's so beautiful. I've always wanted to write about it. I've written about it, but not published anything on it. It's this amazing graphic narrative that's all four issues that tells the story of the Fantastic Four had they never become superheroes and just lived suburban lives on Long Island. <laughs> and it's a very heart-wrenching story about four people deeply trapped in their roles as housewife, as, you know, um, as young brother as like working class boxer that's benjamin grimm mm -hmm. and the story fascinated me because it was so much of it is about their sex life so much of the story is about the idea that they are sexual repressed that they have all of these desires and fantasies that are sublimated and cannot be brought to life and it's amazing because johnny storm like encounters the beatniks and he falls in love with them and even though he's straight he's constantly being called queer by other boys at school. He has a deep, intimate friendship with this other nerdy boy, and they love comics, and that's associated with being gay. He And one of the beatniks actually calls him a holy flaming flower, referencing Jack Kerouac's kind of famous line, you know, the only ones for me are the ones that burn like yellow Roman candles. So I remember reading this, and I thought, did James Sturm bring out a sexual reading of these characters that already existed in the original comic book, or did he make this up? So I went back and started reading the original comic books. And let me tell you, it was all there. He is drawing upon something that was already present in the original text. So that's another way that I create a strong reading is to find things that are already resonant in the text. It is perfectly all right if this is not what the creators intended. Their own intentions can be seen as one of a variety of variables to consider, but it does not ultimately limit the meaning of the text. Because guess what? Once you write that text and it goes out into the world, it far exceeds your intention. People do other things with it. And that's what interests me. So like the fact that Marvel Comics created Luke Cage in large part, the first African-American superhero that, that had his own comic book. The, the fact that they created him primarily to make money off of an African-American audience is beside the point because so many readers found that character meaningful whether or not they knew about the corporate jostling behind his creation. And once he existed, they demanded that the, that the comic book company treat race in a more supple and subtle manner. So, you know, there's a way in which all of those variables, corporate intention, um, the intentions of the creators, they're just that, they're variables. They're not limiting cases about how to do reading, right? And I'll just tell you anecdotally, the number of times I used to present my my uh, my lecture on the queerness of the Fantastic Four. I can't tell you the number of people who are in their 50s and 60s who would come up to me, academics, community people, nonprofit people, and they looked at me and they said, when I was a teenager and I read the Fantastic Four, this is exactly what I thought, but I never had the word queer to describe it. Yeah, I mean, and it speaks to the way it works, right? It speaks to the fact that there's not a, a single reading or, I mean, the implicit reading that you bring out is exactly that, right? You're bringing it out, but it's not, there has to be something there in order for it to be brought up. Exactly. Yeah. Like a good example of this, all the last, I've been talking a long time for this question, but <laughs> Matt Yockey, who's an awesome comic study scholar at the University of Tulsa, he wrote this beautiful piece that I'm really, really moved by that's called um, This Island Manhattan, The Fantastic Four and the Space Race. It's so well-researched. It's such a good reading of the comic, but it only analyzes the first 18 or so issues and it makes a very ideological claim about the idea that the comic book is deeply conservative about the space race, that it is all about white people and Americans controlling the stars. And I say, while this interpretation exists and is very compelling, it can only exist if you ignore the operation of sex and gender. So if you don't think of the Fantastic Four as queer, then yes, they're ordinary, white, normal Americans trying to control space. But in fact, if you pay attention to sex and gender, you see that they are super queer. So when they go off into space, they are not traditional Americans when they come back. They are people who've been penetrated by cosmic rays. And in fact, the irony that he ends at issue 18 is that once you read past issue 18, it gets way, way, way queerer. Hmm. 
So I wanted to tell a different story about the comic book that I didn't feel could be accounted for in his lens, but that doesn't discredit his reading. It just adds another perspective that complicates what he's saying. Have there been any particular theorists that have given you some kind of tool for thinking about either comics or culture more generally that you find most valuable? Like, is there one or two maybe that you you off the bat use or maybe start with when you're approaching a, a new study of, of any kind of cultural aspect? Um, I love this question. There are so many that I could name, but I would say off the top of my head, I'm deeply influenced by the work of Eve Sedgwick kind of one of the founding figures of contemporary queer theory, and the feminist political theorist Linda Zerilli, who is a very unexpected addition to my book, who I kind of reference extensively in the seventh chapter, where I write about the New Mutants in the 80s. So, you know, starting with Eve Sedgwick, you know, Sedgwick is, to my mind, the greatest theorist of heterogeneity that we have in our arsenal. She was obsessed with the idea of how you track the multiplicity of differences even among people of the same, seemingly same identity group. She was fascinated that identity never lines up, meaning the way you identify in terms of your gender or your sexuality or, or your race never has a necessary relationship to any number of other differences, like your sexual object choice, how you desire, in what ways, your temperament, your disposition. She was interested in mapping how literary and cultural production makes room for that kind of multiplicity. Like, how do you look for it? And she felt that queer theory was a really powerful place to do this because desire, which is the great object of queer studies, is itself so infinitely variable. The way we desire, what we desire, what our fantasies are, erotically, socially, intimately, are so diverse that she wanted to imagine what a theory could look like that would attend to that. So in my introduction, I kind of quote her in this beautiful, famous line where she says that queer as a term might describe all of those moments when what she says, what she calls the constituent elements of one's sexuality, one's gender can never line up correctly or like not correctly, but like to a norm. And technically, that's all the time. We never actually achieve any of the norms or ideals of gender and sexuality that we project. So, so, so that's one person. What I love about Linda Zerilli is Zerilli, Zerilli is a scholar who is really interested in thinking about political judgment and like what is the process by which we look at a diverse and heterogeneous world and yet adjudicate or decide what forms of governance, social action of collective life are better or worse than others, even knowing that whenever we make the decision, we're foreclosing other possibilities. She's very influenced here by Hannah Arendt, the famous political theorist. And so what she's really interested in is conditions of possibility. How do we create conditions where we can imagine the world otherwise and actually respond collectively to that, to collective action? So she allows me to think about superhero comic books as an endless meditation on people acting in concert. I mean, that's really what superhero comics, especially superhero team books are about. Mm -hmm. They are always this endless visual meditation on people looking at the world and saying, we need to act together to respond to current realities in order to transform the conditions of our living. What could be more useful for thinking about that in democratic political theory, which is an extended study of how people decide to act collectively to respond to real world problems. So those are two of the theorists I'm really drawn to, but I'm also, you can tell, I'm very deeply a Foucauldian. You know, I think about comics the way that Foucault would. I think about them as just like these elaborate discursive formations that are made up of lots of different variables. So like I say in my book, you know, if you were a traditional Marxist, it would be very easy to read almost every single comic book production as merely a corporate plot, right? That is just, this would be a vulgar Marxism, like where you would just read every single character like Luke Cage, like the Black Panther, as, as an easy sell. It's Marvel Comics trying to sell diversity. Well, it is that, but it's also other things. And a Foucauldian frame allows you to kind of read the multiplicity of ways that comics make sense to people outside of the limits of one system. 
Well, yeah, that, no, I mean, that's great. And it makes me think of a problem that you might run across if you were approaching comics as, well, no one I'm sure would identify as it, but as a sort of vulgar Marxist in which this is all superstructure and the real base is what we need to draw attention to. Mm-hmm. And so you don't pay attention to any really exactly. uh, character development because you want to find an economic argument. Exactly. I was going to say even worse is also then reading all character development as merely an ex- extension of corporate demands, which suggests, which drops out the artist. So then you're saying the artist has zero agency. But in in fact, we know that as the comic book industry became more and more corporate in the 80s and after, artists often resisted the demands of the corporation. And you see that resistance play out in the evolution of certain characters. So what I'm interested in is mapping out sites of contestation, contradiction, where All of these different forces are playing out at the same time, rather than just saying a one-to-one relationship between economics and the content of comics. Because I don't want to lose sight of the fact that readers are multiplicitous and they read and interpret the text in complex ways. Mm -hmm. They often do not have access to the inner workings of the comic book industry. So even if a character or a plot line is merely a corporate plot, readers might not always see it that way. They might make things of it that are complex, you know? And I'm interested in mapping all of those nodes rather than just saying that it's one thing. Mm -hmm. Well, if what problems, if any, or what sort of pitfalls do you have to guard against, especially when you're doing this kind of work? Because, yeah, vulgar Marxists might go into it looking purely for an economic argument, but also someone interested in a queer reading might see everything as queer in a comic. Mm -hmm. Which is not necessarily uh, wrong, but you're trying to do, you're looking for something that you want to be there. I know my favorite superheroes, I do not want them to be racist or homophobic or problematic. Yeah, yeah. So these are sort of pitfalls that you might come across. What other things do you have to consider that you might, these traps that you might intellectually fall into when you're doing these kinds of readings? So one is what you've already named, which is a deterministic approach where you say the meaning of this character or this plot line or this thing is a direct effect of one variable. Mm -hmm. The meaning of Luke Cage is the selling of diversity by Marvel Comics. So the first is to recognize that the meaning of any character, plot, storyline, formal innovation is always multiplicitous. The meaning is always being produced from multiple angles. So part of it is guarding against one reading or offering one reading and then saying, but you could also read it this way, right? Mm. Another is to take into account multiple variables It's to say like, but what if I put this thing in a different context? How, what would it mean? Right. In the corporate offices of Marvel Comics, it might be that they really want to sell to black audience. But in the hands of an African-American teenager living in Harlem, seeing Luke Cage has a profoundly powerful effect on someone's life. Now, also, not all black readers are going to read or interpret Luke Cage the same way. But he's going to make certain possibilities available. So one way of avoiding the trap of determinism is that you don't produce interpretations that lead to a final reading. Rather, you open up possibilities. You say, here is what this text offers as one possibility. It allows us to read Johnny Storm as a queer flaming character. Is that all that he is? No. But that's one very powerful available reading. So I try to do that very much in my book. This is, you know, Mark Singer's kind of intense critique of my book often says that I fix readings and that I do, I kind of force the queer reading onto the text. Mm -hmm. And I find that really unusual because I feel like my book is obsessively claiming to the reader, look, there are so many possibilities for how you could interpret this. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing it one way. And I think, but I think that's a very powerful way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And and like you say, I think nuance is really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, thinking about multiple contexts in which these texts circulate and have meaning and avoiding determinism. I mean, I think those are two really, really powerful ways to avoid that trap. And also just questioning yourself as a scholar, like, why am I looking for certain things? Mm -hmm. You know, why am I ignoring other things and, and, and not looking at this or not looking at that? Now, after after completing this work and reading thousands and thousands of pages of comics, I'm just curious. So, mm-hmm. Do you want to read more comics, or did this <laughs> did this kind of kill it for a while for you? I'm I don't know if I could read that it much, did. and it would I mean, have the same it, effect. 
Yeah, I think that's a very fair question. I, I don't read comics for fun anymore. It did kind of actually put me in a place where as much as I love comics, I don't really want to follow them that much. I also have deep nostalgic attachments now to particular eras of Marvel Comics production, like the 1970s and the early 1980s, that I don't necessarily love the, the, the current production. I did read very widely in contemporary comics up to about 2013, 2014 to revise my conclusion of my book because I really wanted it to be up to date. Mm -hmm. I also want to spend my money elsewhere, right? Like I'm working on a new project that has a lot of its own sources that are not comic books. And I like to spend my money on that rather than buying comics. However, I have a very extensive graphic novel collection and I still buy a lot of collected editions. I buy a lot of the Marvel omnibus editions of a different comics, but I'm very selective about what I get. Like Alpha Flight, I'm very fascinated by Alpha Flight, the Canadian superhero team. I'm fascinated by the later Thor in the late 60s and early 70s. So I read those things for fun when I have time, which is very rare. So I'm still deeply invested in comics, but not in an encyclopedic way. You know, there's a lot that I haven't read. I'm woefully underread in independent comics, partly because I don't have time, partly because I'm really more interested in superhero comic books. But let me tell you, queer comics production is where it's at. Like LGBTQ <laughs> comics are exploding the industry. They're kind of taking over the independent comics industry. And I have remained invested in the study of comics like I have co-edited a forthcoming special issue of American literature, which is like the premier journal in the study of American literature. And the issue I've co-edited it with Derek Scott, an extraordinary African-American literature scholar. And the issue is called Queer About Comics. And it's about the intersection of queer theory and comic studies. We have unbelievable essays that look at everything from the Black Panther to the character Rogue in the X-Men, of course, to Alison Bechtel, to David mm -hmm. Wojnarowicz and Kathy Acker and, you know, Lost Girls by Alan Moore. Just a huge range of comics. And it offers a whole new theoretical model for thinking about comics. I'm also the lead editor alongside Shelley Streeby and Deborah Whaley of Keywords for Comic Studies for NYU Press. And we're going to have this amazing volume of 62 scholars writing about different keywords in the field. And that should be out in 2019. That sounds great. I'm very deep invested in comics, but I don't know. They're not necessarily part of my everyday lifeblood anymore the way they used to be. And would, would you say that that's just a sort of natural thing that anything you were to work on would probably result in intense reading and then moving on? Or is that something that is a result of the comics themselves, like a, a, as opposed to other things you could be studying? Uh, no, I think that happens to everyone, honestly. I think that you uh, different people have different thresholds mm -hmm. for engaging with different archives. I spent 10 years from inception to publication working on this book. Like I came up with the idea when I was a senior, as an undergraduate, I started forming the idea more precisely as a graduate student, six, seven years in graduate school. Then I had it finished. Then it went through two years of revision. So I'm, I'm quite, I love that archive, but I needed space from it mm -hmm. so I could think about other things. And also, you know, I love comics, but they're not my favorite medium. I find them very difficult to read. I find them very stressful on my eyes. So my thing is that I find comics to be unbelievably productive intellectually, but I don't always find them the most fun to read on an everyday level like I used to. So, I mean, I'm very attached to film. I was trained in cinema studies and I'm very attached to certain forms of literature. But, you know, one chapter of my new book is about serial comic strips, but the rest of it is about many media. I write about movies. I write about novels. I write about theater, uh, visual culture and art. So my thing is this. Comics have allowed me to ask a series of intellectual questions that are really central to my thinking. So they're always going to be present in what I do. And I've also thought a lot about down the line writing a sequel to the new mutant that would probably be called marvelous corp that would be about the figure of genocide and mass death hmm. in the superhero comic book since 1990 and i have a new article that i submitted recently that's called legions of superheroes multiplicity um what is it it's diversity multiplicity and collective action against genocide in the superhero comic book and it looks at this just unbelievably beautiful beautiful and heart-wrenching miniseries called Legion Lost that was produced in 1999 by Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning. And it, it's this amazing miniseries about the Legion of Superheroes and how a particular series of members of the team get lost in another universe where everybody is being mass murdered by an unknown villain and about how they respond to it since their mandate in their own universe is to stop atrocities like this. Mm -hmm. And so I I still think about comics that I love, but often I write about them because they were comics I didn't get to write about in the book. 
right? Like things that I always wanted to write about. Mm-hmm. If it was an eighth chapter, it would have been about Age of Apocalypse, the famous X-Men storyline, and Legion Lost as genocide narrative. So I think that comics will always circulate back, but I don't feel that I always have to be in a simple through line, always writing a book about comics. And I don't think anybody needs to be beholden to one set of objects permanently. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting the way the way that you frame uh, your research in that way. Do you have uh, for anyone who's who's read your book, perhaps a younger uh, graduate student or something uh, who is inspired to work on comics, but is just starting out? Do you have any advice after this, these massive experience that you've had and acquired through writing this? Uh, any advice for someone starting out that wants to study comics academically? Oh, that's so interesting. First of all, know to your core that this is a valuable thing to study. Second, recognize that comics are unbelievably untapped terrain to study. Unlike so many literary fields where people have found even the most esoteric work, comics is a field of such expansive cultural production. There are thousands of comics nobody has ever written about. So I was the keynote speaker for the International Comics Art Forum, which is a great honor to be invited, you know, it's the, it's the biggest international conference for the study of comics. And every talk I went to after my keynote, somebody talked about a comic book I've never heard. And I would say, where did this come from? And they would say, well, this was the most popular Danish comic book of the 1970s. Or, you know, this was the most highly respected work of comic strip art in 1945 in France. Like, I was just so blown away by the amount of stuff that is so valuable, so important globally from Japan from Nigeria, Mm -hmm. from from all of these different places that people have not studied. So recognize that there is a vast archive, not only only, independent comics, but superhero comic books that is to be studied across time periods. Third, don't limit yourself to one genre. The superhero comic books are oddly very understudied in comic books studies, even though they are overrepresented in the mass market arena. Because a lot of people have said, if we're going to legitimize the field, we have to write about really great independent comics. Well, there's something really valuable about studying superhero comic books, too, and doing it well. But the last thing and the most important thing I would say is, look, just like with any other object, if you're going to study superhero comic books or independent comics, you need to treat them with the utmost rigor and intellectual depth. So if you're going to read comics, you need to be reading high theory. You need to read cultural studies, cultural history, intellectual history. Make comics a valuable part of the world that we live in and don't separate them out from other bigger questions of politics, society, culture. When you do that, you're going to produce good work on comics. And so I think like another way of putting this is like, In your own work, take comics as seriously as you would any other canonical kind of literature, but be open-ended about it and don't reproduce assumptions that people have made in the past. I remember writing a review of an essay that was sent to me by a journal where the person spent 10 pages talking about how superhero comic books are trash and like nobody should be studying them. And I thought that's an awful thing to say. (laughs) <laughs> also not true, right? And you don't need to use superhero comic books as a, a straw man mm. in order to claim that independent comics are valuable. Study both. Study independent comics if you want. Study superhero comics if you want. So I encourage people also to be expansive and generous about what they study and not to pick and choose like this is great and this sucks. Like be open to all of these things. So those are some different ways that I would say to start. And the the last thing actually I'll add is like email those of us who do this work, right? Hmm. Like that's what we exist to do. If you're a grad student, you're thinking about comics, email us, you know, email me, email other scholars like Charles Hatfield, Hillary Chu. We're busy, but we'll try to get back to you. You know, we can give you advice because we're all in it together. I think that is such an excellent way to wrap up. I don't want to I don't want to ruin it by going any (laughs) further. I mean, I think, Ramsey, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. And I think uh, I I have no doubt that you will inspire a number of uh, of people who may have thought about this, but were uh, were timid or were not sure how to begin. Yeah, well, great. I'm so happy. That would be that would be beautiful.